A lot of the buildings have changed since I was last here because of the massive expansion, but some of it does remind me of my previous adventure here 12 years ago. You can see we've got many species of animals shot all over the place, a lot of which are by Steve and Jason themselves, as well as other members of staff probably. Well, come on. We created our own little toys. The 50s. Most of the animals that you saw up front were Joyce Hornadies. Most of these animals in here are going to be Steve Hornadies. Um, the mule deer, several of Jason's are in there. Um, but Steve is one of the few in the world that has a World Ovis Slam, uh, which is a very, very difficult and expensive uh, journey to embark on. Um, so a lot of these goat and sheep species are from all over the world, Uzbekistan, Pakistan, Kyrgyzstan, uh, all of these you know exotic animals, uh, plus the North American bighorn sheep. This uh, crocodile here, Steve uh, killed at the Riverside Golf Course with his pitching wedge. Just kidding, oh, that, <laughs> it's an African croc. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Wrapped in bamboo, the table here is one solid strip out of a, I believe it's pronounced a duca tree from Africa. Um, this thing was brought over and finished milled on site with custom uh, welded legs to support the table. It weighs about 2,000 pounds. Um, obviously, we've continued the taxidermy. Um, some of your traditional African plain species, the African trash panda, um, jaguar, stuff like that. Just some really, or leopard rather, really cool uh, taxidermy in a really neat room. And outside of just the beautiful table, the bamboo, the taxidermy, we have these two cabinets here. And this is a really neat piece of outdoor industry history. So Ruger is a very trusted name in firearms in the, in the shooting world. And since the 1950s, they've really been incredibly innovative in manufacturing techniques that would allow them to make a really high quality product at an affordable price. And Joyce Hornady founded this company in 1949. And Bill Ruger and Joyce Hornady were personal friends. And Steve Hornady himself, Joyce's son, does not know why this happens or why it happened, but when the serial number 0053 came up in production at Ruger, that firearm was sent to Hornady Manufacturing. So every semi-automatic that you see in this window and every revolver, lever action, shotgun, and bolt action in that window, every single firearm shares the 0053 serial number. So we don't know if it was because Joyce Hornady was Bill Ruger's 53rd best friend or what the significance of the number 53 is, but all of these firearms share the exact same serial number. And that's just, that's, that's pretty darn cool. And it's a special bond between companies that were founded in that post-World War II era and became incredibly innovative in the outdoor space. I'm Joyce Hornady. You might say accuracy is my business. I make bullets. 10 bullets through one hole was the philosophy of Joyce Hornady. So Seth kind of walked you through, but the original part of the front of the building is that stone facade that's in the lobby now that we just walk, you walk through when you're coming in. So this part, when my, my grandfather started, he put everything in its own building. So tools was over here, bullets was over here, ammo was across the parking lot, and he had a little wholesale business that was over here. Um, and the reason he did that was in case something didn't go well and he needed to get rid of one of the businesses, he could sell the whole thing. He could sell the business, the building, the property, 
And after he passed away, my dad was like, we need to just combine all this. And so there has been a challenge to put everything underneath one roof since um, they started doing that. So this was one of the first expansions we did in about 2008, and it combined the bullet plant with the ammo plant. It added a warehouse. Um, then in 2012, we filled in the, the parking lot that was over there. So we're going to kind of follow the construction. So um, as we walk through, this is this was engineering. Um, it is now our sales and marketing offices. Upstairs we have tech. Um, as we come through here. Um, it has since moved to a different location, and this is now part of what we call maintenance. Maintenance is everything from fixing stuff to building tooling, supporting all the machinery. We don't necessarily make all the tooling, we buy a lot, but we can make anything we need. This was part of the expansion that we did that was part of the sales office, and it was combining what it was at the time. So that expansion also connected what at the time was our ammo plant. And so when I started here in 2006, all of our ammunition was loaded and packed in this room. So the whole entire thing, which when you see the ammo plant today, you'll, you'll kind of scratch your head and wonder how we did it. And I still scratch my head and wonder how we did it. So then we did another expansion and added a new ammo plant. And as we added the new ammo plant, we vacated this. And then in 2008, the business took off that we ended up moving back in here. Now this is engineering. So this is all our engineers. I like to call it the prima donna area because they have all the newest, neatest stuff. Part of ammo until we moved out and now the maintenance department's grown so much that we're, uh, we, we've moved into here. So maintenance has kind of expanded. And it's basically taken over all of what ammo was at one point. So this was the new ammo plant and the, the government made us lower the ceilings and we had to put in um, these static proof lights and all that stuff because as soon as you say ammunition loading everybody gets all concerned that it's going to be explosive and it's, it's just not. Um, so what this has turned into is also part of maintenance. We call this the rebuild area. This used to be the shipping dock, it's now the lead receiving area. Thousand pound pigs of lead. This is a thousand pound pig. Um, funny story, during COVID, we used to get all our lead in 60 pound pigs, which we would all call them. But we get lead in 60 pound pig. During COVID, our guys were doing what everybody did. So anything we can do to get more. And so the guys from our lead vendor said, well, you're the only people we make 60 pound pigs for. If you could take them in 1,000 pound pigs, we'll save you 2% and we can ship you more lead. In 70 years, nobody thought to bring this up. I mean, so it just one of those things that it, it was a big lesson to learn, which is always ask questions. Is there anything different? And so we changed our entire lead processing to accommodate these 1,000 these pound pigs. And this right here basically represents the truck load. Because that's all in here. So yeah, roughly two trucks there. Very warm in here.
side. So that's what this machine does. These are all 200 yard groups until it's made on this track. This is the only climate control building in the whole of Grand Island. And people love working here because they go from 100 degrees in the summer to minus 10 in the winter. So they like it being there. to mention that there are every individual process gets its own individual lot number. Um, when you watched the history video you saw that iconic image of Joyce Hornady standing uh, below ground level with the tunnels uh, right around 1960 when they built this part of the facility. Um, this side there's two sides to it we've got a hundred and two hundred yard side which is here which we'll talk to Dean and Dave about and across the way here we have a 25 yard tunnel Right now, this lab gets used for some R&D items, and it, the lion's share of what we're doing down here is testing bullets for accuracy. You saw upstairs, we don't load ammunition here anymore, we make bullets. And if you're gonna make bullets, they are useless if you can't hit what you're aiming at. So we do everything we can to ensure we make the most accurate bullets on the market, and nobody hangs with our stuff from an accuracy and a volume standpoint, they just don't. So. The way it works, the operators, when they set their bullets up, uh, they'll send them down for accuracy, they'll test them for accuracy, and then they'll tweak the press as necessary, all the dies and the punches. Very small, minute, sometimes tenths of a thousandths worth of adjustment to get things really perfect. 
and then there's a, a schedule in which they have to shoot for accuracy. So they send them down pneumatically to Dean and Dave, who hand load with love each individual cartridge, and then they'll shoot them whether at 100 or 200 yards, depending on the bullet. And I'll probably let Dean and Dave talk a little bit about the procedure. Um, but one of the big changes uh, with Dean and Dave being down here that we've implemented is digital accuracy. So typically these were shot and we'd have to go down range to physically measure and cut out the group. Well now we use that digitally. There's an example of an accuracy lab report uh, up on the wall just blown up large scale right beside the monitor there. Mm -hmm. And Dave or Dean if you guys wouldn't mind walk these gentlemen through what happens when the tube comes down with the bullets and and how that works. Okay. Uh, We'll just use this as an example. I got the tube from upstairs. It shows me the press number, what bullet it is, and from that point I determine what I'm gonna shoot it out of. If I'm gonna shoot it out of a 223 or something like that. We have a, it's just a standard load we use. And this bullet been shot at 100 yards, had to hold a group size of one inch or better. Two grains of Rotumbo, uh, whatever it may be and then they have all of their cartridge cases and their barrel, barrels serialized so that these cartridge cases only see that chamber. They're neck sized for consistency. And then I'll let Dave run away with what's going on actually inside the tunnel. Dave? Yep, so after Dean gets his bullets, he'll pick the rifle that we'll shoot it out of, the caliber. He'll load them, bring them in here, and in You guys can we'll step in there too. We'll set up the test on the computer and in the Ailer system. Once the test is set up, I'll get the barrels out, load the ammunition, step outside of the room. This is air actuated, so everything is hands off. No human hands touch the barrel, so there's no pulling or tweaking or anything else. Step outside of the room, fire the cartridge, come back in, reload. Everything is caught on camera. Well, basically, from our sound devices that are downrange on the 100 yard and 200 yard tunnels. This is a tunnel, the underground tunnel, when it was built back in 57, I believe, 58. And if you would like, the uh, barrel's clear, you could look downrange. The target on the left is 100 yards, the target on the right is 200 yards. And what scope is it? Nope. Yeah. How are you? Can you fix it right there? Yep. Yeah. yeah, that's not easy. To what it's in Ford of now, right? Yeah, group analysis, and that's one of the reasons why it's in there, is so many people get wrapped around the axle of shooting so groups and trying to find the right powder charge in reality, they're all the same. It's so funny, about a year ago, you know, I'm ready to do the rifle. And I want you to keep in mind the scope of what this area is for when we go out west this afternoon. Because what you're seeing here is where we tested pressure and velocity for all of our ammunition. Mm -hmm. Remember, Jason showed you the room where all of the ammo was loaded and all of the ammo was tested for PNV here. Uh, it was sent down pneumatically in the tubes, just like the bullets. And we've got a Ulysses brand a universal receiver, which is kind of the benchmark standard that everybody uses for the piezoelectric uh, pressure reading system. And we have one bay and we'll step in here and have a look at it. Is it okay to film? Yes, absolutely. So uh, keep in mind what you're looking at here, right? This is uh, one universal receiver to shoot one test at a time. And this is where all of our ammo used to go through. Uh, and we, we cranked out a lot of ammo, a lot of high quality ammo through here. Um, now all of our ammunition is done at a separate facility, which we'll show you and you'll be able to see um, the scale difference of what is here versus what we have there. We still use this a ton. We shoot bullets for expansion in here. We shoot gel, we shoot wax, we have a chronograph set up. And when the lab is slow, you can even come down here, sight in your pistol or your uh, new red dot. Uh, but this is the universal receiver. Keep that in mind. One receiver in one little room. And when we go out west, it's, it's pretty remarkable.
So is this uh, is this Steve's desk then? Yep. Yeah, okay, you want a funny picture? You want to give you a funny one? You're gonna sit behind it. <laughs> but you can't print it. Actually, I don't care if you. That's what happens when Dad isn't in his office. <laughs> We were one of the few industries that, well, everybody was doing this, we were doing this because of, just because of the way it works. And so we were able to pick up 35 of their employees as well, which very rarely, when you, very rarely do you need 35, and very rarely are you able to get them that quick. So it turned into a really, a really good deal for us. Much quieter plant. Um, that particular part of the business is a little slower right now because during COVID we sold about eight years worth of stuff in two years. And so. How are you? Good. So the way this building works is half of it is warehouse. So this is all warehouse and shipping. We do ship um, all our tool products and our security products out of this facility. And then everything on this end is all production. And we're kind of walking in at the tail end of production. Um, but what is happening here is this is an assembly line. And when we moved out here from over there, we were able to upgrade our ability to manufacture. It used to be we'd have one person in a corner putting together a press. Well, now they flow through like an automobile does, and we can move material in and out to make it easier for them to assemble. So we caught them, of course, right at lunch. Um, but there you'll see lock and load APs, which is our progressive press, and on the right is our, our classic press. Those are coming through, and they'll come through and get packaged. A lot of reloaders. Hi, guys. That's a cool, cool visual. Yeah, it's a lot of presses right there. And, and anything you guys want, you can photo here. It's no issue. Hi. Was prior to that recession, buying new turning centers and lathes were expensive, and this, build, this business didn't substantiate it. Well, what happened is we were able to buy machines for 10 cents on the dollar during that time because people were selling whatever assets they could to stay afloat. Everything in here was upgraded during that time. And then the business also grew, so we've been able to substantially improve our ability to manufacture. This happens to be die assembly when they're all at lunch. But you'll see we have a lot of different parts, and this is all gravity fed towards die assembly. Um, this on the back there? <laughs> Hi, how are you? Good. So she's back here doing die assembly and putting them in boxes. Oh, we're going to look over your shoulder. What's putting together? I'm doing 9mm taper crimp. 9mm taper crimp die. Yeah. You guys have been following me with cameras all day. We go out this way, guys. That's, and these machines are some of the ones that I was talking about that we were able to upgrade substantially. So we're feeding in a 7 8 bar stock. It comes into the machine, and the, the best part about this machine is you'll see we do have an operator over there, but he's got how many machines are you running? Just these two. But he doesn't even have to stand here. It's going to come in, and it just moves the part. But it's coming in. It's moving that bar stock in. It's working on one end of the part. When it's done doing the work on this part, it's gonna cut that die off, transfer it over here, and if you look over here, it's doing more work on this end right now. This does the operations that used to take four different machines to do. So our throughput on dies went through the roof and our cost went down because you didn't have those different operations you had to move through. So there it just took the part it's gonna start working on that end. Now it's working on this one. And then when it's done, they'll come up here and drop it on this conveyor and spit it out. Yeah, they're pretty neat. Part, a raw part. They'll mount it on one of these tombstones and then it will feed into the machine. The machine will come in and probe the part, determine what it is, and then it'll pull the tooling it needs and do the operations on those parts. Well, the cool thing is, it can do that for one tombstone, 
the next tombstone that rolls in is a whole different set of parts. Which means, instead of having to run 500 of one thing, and then switch over 500, switch over 500, now I can do more on-demand manufacturing for this business. So that's exactly what's going on here. Um, where I've mounted this part. I'll get out of your way. But when it's done, it's gonna come out like yay. Expansion. This building was built in thirds. So this third would have been warehouse and shipping. The next third would be raw materials, storage, and packaging. Raw materials for ammo is what I mean. Um, and then the last third would be um, Pearson Prime and load. Um, what we've done is we basically have replicated the whole thing, and this whole area will turn into warehouse. The whole building will just kind of pivot 180. Loading and Pearson Prime will be replicated in the new area. And so we'll walk through that new area quick just to kind of give you a size and scale, and then we'll come back through and we'll finish the lab, I reckon. Bullets, cartridge cases. So there's a still smell of paint. You could call this world of ammo, guys. <laughs> It's not quite full yet, but the paint is still wet. Yeah, but it's getting wet. <laughs> so we've already moved some inspection pack into here. Hi guys. Um, and that's surely because that is a bottleneck for us, so. Yes. This is all final inspection over here. I'll be inspecting loaded rounds. I've seen this in person, it's impre impressive the speed at which they can roll their little palm full of ammunition from one end of the arm to the end of the fingers and inspect every bullet, every case neck, every case shoulder on the way. Three rooms are just now coming into service and they're going to replicate the next three rooms we see. Um, but this just kind of gives you an idea of what we're planning on as far as growth and growth. You know, a lot of times you hear people talk, they'll talk about getting a machine or they're going to do this to try and grow. Yeah, we're pretty serious about, about some of the, the growth and the things we want to do to service people better. So the first room is going to be Pearson Prime. Photo escape. Hmm? If you guys recall, here's my finished cartridge case. Now it may or may not have gone through plug and taper. This is a 38 special, so it's not. But what's happening here is I'm feeding the cartridge case in, coming in in the back there. Coming in right here. It goes in, mouth down, over an arbor. We come in, we pierce it, and the flashing actually goes through that arbor so it doesn't stay in the case. And it's going to rotate to the back. At the very back of this machine, there's a flapper. And that flapper is putting in a primer. And so it'll put in the primer, seat the primer, and now I do have a finished case. It's ready to load. And if you, if you look in there, you can see the flash hole.
So what this is doing is it's taking those cartridges and it gets them up in this track and orients them, the bullet will naturally fall down. You can see So it'll spit them out, fill these two stones, come over, bolt the box, shove the ammo into the box. This is basically a packaging machine. This machine's alternating the cases, so they'll go in a, um, a more compact box, a 1500 count box. Compensates for the taper on the case. Jason thinks he's a bit jinxed, and whenever he stands near a machine with a group of journalists, they go into a little stop and pause moment thinking about things. This is final inspect and pack. And so what she's gonna do, everything we do, especially for the prices we charge, we feel like you should get jewelry or feel like it's jewelry when you open one of our boxes. So she's gonna grab these cartridges, orient them, roll them, and look for scratches, dents, and dings. And the thing that makes me the most happy is I haven't watched her put one in these scratch and dent yet <laughs> since we've been standing here. But if you pull them, these are beautiful. These are ones that she's pulled out. <laughs> well, where's the dent? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> you have to ask her. That one got pulled for that. Okay. All right, we'll have to ask her. Show me those two, will you? Front card. Looks like a Okay. Here's your trade. Yeah. Uh, the light helps. It's all good. Uh, yeah, you can start picking up. Yeah, but how can you see that? I mean, it's amazing. Yeah. 54. 54. 54 cases, so that's 540 boxes. 540 boxes. Yep. 
Yep. 540 boxes of 20 rounds. Yep. Mm -hmm. And this, of course, yeah. up to now, we have still the days not in. Yeah, right. There's not much ammo that they are not going to use to shoot. Yeah, because it's uh, the... No problem. <laughs> Still 1%. <laughs> yeah. So 1% times half a million rounds. You don't know... You know no smoking, no photo, no video. So. <laughs> you know, in that tunnel that was built in the early 1960s, we shot all of our bullets and all of our ammo and did all of our R&D in that, that facility. And at the time, it was state of the art. Well, the times have changed, and I want you to remember what that facility was. Remember the pressure reading equipment that we had there, and then see how it compares. Yeah, yeah you guys can uh, please go in. Yeah, no, you're good. Yeah, you take a photo of this, but nothing close up on anything that may be proprietary. Hi, Tom. How are you, Tom? Are you doing orange? If are you, you would, then. Are you doing it? Yeah. Come hither and uh, what are you using? let's talk about what we do here. Eliminator for the most part. I don't have a car coming first with the cover. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Israel? These are proof barrels. It's not exactly uh, this one. These cool are range. pressure and velocity barrels. And Matt, yeah, Matt will expand on all this. So at this point, we'll cut the video and photography out uh, as we go through the testing procedure and the testing equipment. Um, Matt uh, is kind of the lead in here in the lab, and he'll walk us through what it is, what they do. Where we had the old lab in the other building, we were very limited in the testing we could do. We could have one gun in one range, so everything from pressure velocity testing to bullet expansion testing and handbook load data all had to be shot in the same range. But we far exceeded our, our, our uh, capabilities over there, and so a lot of that went into the design of the design of the new lab. So the first three doors you see here is a 25 yard or 25 meter range, where we're not really worried about what happens downrange, but what we're looking at is just the pressure and velocity. Uh, bay 1 is shot shells, Bay 2 is pistol revolver ammunition, Bay 3 is kind of a short barrel rifle or anything we don't, we're not going to shoot for accuracy. Bays 4 and 5 is where we have our 100 meter tunnel. So we're doing pressure, velocity, and accuracy. So downrange we have microphone array that will measure the group size for us. We don't shoot anything on paper anymore. And so anytime we shoot a new lot of ammunition, we're going to shoot for pressure, velocity, and accuracy. System 85, it's, it's a really good yeah, system yeah. for just a uh, simple ballistic testing. If we need to do more advanced stuff for um, anything else, we, we might uh, upgrade. But what you see here is a sample test report for what we're looking at. Right down, it's probably a little blurry. Uh, this is a, a 6.5 Creedmoor. So what we have here, uh, a simple five shot test. What this is, is just a powder assessment. It's not a full lot assessment, but it's just a, a production test. So we're all we're looking for is target velocity, target, or maximum average pressure, and we'll shoot five shots. We'll look at the, the summary, the averages, to make sure we're within tolerance of velocity. Um, we have our pressure well under the limit. Uh, our time here, action time, we're looking for hang fire, delayed ignition, uh, well well within spec. This is what you have to see. Okay. So what you see right ahead of the gun is Seventy-eight foot midpoint, which would be the distance between those chronograph screens, uh, to establish all of their standards for velocity. Okay. Fair enough. And that, that Nothing in, if not consistent. Yes. Yeah. So that and, and then got transposed over to NATO, who used the, the twenty-four meter, which is twenty-three point seven seven. And that was originally called the Aberdeen velocity. Aberdeen. So yeah, the 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 uh, Aberdeen proof wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well. 
It sounds so historic now, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. Surprised they didn't use spider webs or something like that. <laughs> spider webs. And they used the 16 meter range for a 9 millimeter because just the, the distance yeah. uh, is enough. And the 16 meter came from, I think, 52 and a half uh, feet that they used for the old 30 carbine. Okay. Yeah. Uh, quite honestly, this is just cool, but there's also a purpose, right? We have to ensure that the ammunition that we're manufacturing feeds, fits, and functions in a variety of platforms. So we need short barrels, we need semi-automatic, bolt guns, lever guns, single shots, suppressed, unsuppressed. We need to have literally every single conceivable fashion of firearm to test through. And so uh, a lot of these firearms are just for that. They're for function testing, whether that be uh, you know, looking for velocity or accuracy or just plain does it fit in the magazine, does it function from that magazine. And so we've got a lot of history in here and various, you know, book literature. Just, just checking, yeah, Seth, Marduce there, that's a real one, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I've shot that one, actually. <laughs> yeah. So you shoot them on the shoulder? The guns, yeah. And you have to put a scope on that? Of course. Yeah. Because most of them don't have it now. So yeah, if we if we need one, they'll swap an optic on there. That's no problem. This is oh, this one. Yeah. Six point five pre. Yeah, a 1919 machine gun, chambered in six point five pre horn. Why not? Why not? That was probably Matt's Friday project or something. It was a, it was a collaboration. You the seven miles. Favorite? Yeah, yeah. Let's do that. Seven. You actually make them at uh, for this? We do. We have in the past. Uh, it'll be it'll be out again. You can you can actually find the ammunition for sale, or you haven't even announced it yet. What cartridge is this? 4.6 by 30 millimeter. Wow. This is one of the very few in the United States, mm -hmm. basically. It is, and they're, they're very rare, they're very expensive. So to have one for function and casualty testing, we want to make sure to be very careful with it. Mm -hmm. The replacement cost, if we, if we had to buy a new one, it would be tens of thousands of dollars. It would probably be 50 or 60 thousand dollars. Hence why in an armored building, in an armored room, it's in an armored safe. Right. <laughs> because it's a special one. 13 inch barrel single so shot rifle. This is the ammunition for the, what was it called, yeah. the rifle again? No, this is the MP7. MP7. Is that an H and K or something? And that is 4.6 would be 0.183 caliber. 4.6 millimeter by 30. Was it 30 or 32? 30. Of guns where wow. Well action That's super rare. Uh, that's the competitor to the 5.7 for it. And then you can just straight or chamber. It's pretty rare. That's telling Franco, this is part of the job. This isn't, you know, somebody's got to shoot guns. If you're going to be an outdoor writer, you need to shoot some guns, right? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, those are four six. Ho 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 ho! The one with the 1921 Tommy gun. I actually shot this one 12 years ago when I was here before. Back in those days, we didn't video everything. So what it is? Open bolt submachine gun, a 45 caliber. The bolt is back. When you fire it, pull the trigger. The bolt goes forward and fires. So. Front grip, freeze tight against the shoulder. Yeah, we'll freeze ammo. <laughs> just have to uh, shoot in bursts yeah, or the long strings. It, got it has a, a fairly moderate rate of fire. It's a little fast, but uh, very heavy. So if it gets away from you, just have you lip, ease off the trigger, shoot in short bursts. Actually going on the target. You might want it on your shoulder. On the target. You didn't make a smiley face! <laughs> wow.
Well, no one got shot, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.